I'm Bill Grop, director of NCSA at the University of Illinois, and I'll be your session chair for today. This session presents talks from the winners of the Society Awards. These are the, among the highest honors that we bestow on our community, and it's an opportunity to hear from some of the leaders in our field. Our first presentation will be given by the winner of this year's ACM IEEE Computer Society, Ken Kennedy Award. David Abertson is currently the Director of Research Computing at the University of Queensland. He's been involved in computer architecture and high-performance computing research since 1979, and has held appointments at Griffith University, CSIRO, RMIT, and Monash University. He is a fellow of ACM, of IEEE, the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, and the Australian Computer Society. And with that, uh, please welcome David. Thanks, Bill. Good morning, and thank you, Bill. The best part about it is, for the next 45 minutes, I don't have to wear a mask. <laughs> So it's, it, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much to those who are in the audience and uh, to those of you who are online uh, and those watching afterwards. Um, I hope you enjoy this. Um, I'm going to talk about translational computer science and application to supercomputing, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. So as you well know, this is uh, an award talk for the Ken Kennedy Award, which I have to say I am absolutely delighted to accept. Um, it really has been a big thrill for me and my family. Um, and, and as the citation says there, this is for innovation in uh, parallel and distributed computing tools and applications. So I'm going to tell you something today about some of those computing tools and the applications that, that have driven us along the way. Um, uh, Jeff Hollingsworth added the, an amendment to this um, during the planning process. It wasn't at all clear that this was, uh, that I was going to get here. Uh, so Jeff's first amendment there is that what I should really be getting it for is for diligence in navigating international travel regulations. So for those of you who come from abroad, you'll know that this is not an easy time. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you to, uh, to Bronis and Jeff, who really kept nudging me to, to get here and made it possible. I also want to, at this stage, also acknowledge my family and thank them for all the support to my wife and three daughters. Um, because they're very much behind uh, a lot of the achievements that I'm talking about today. So thank you to them. So I think the, let's start on a, on a lighter note. I think the SC community knows a lot about virtualization and, and let's face it, for the last two years we've been living a very virtual existence. Um, the fact that I was only a month ago planning that I would be doing this remotely using the technologies that we've all played with seemed kind of that was the way it was going to pan out. Um, so as a keen cyclist, I've also been cycling virtually for the last year. Um, and um, this is quite an interesting experience. And I thought, well, if I, if I can't get here, the very least I should do is go for a bike ride somewhere near St. Louis. Well, so it turns out no one's bothered filming St. Louis for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Um, but I did find a bike ride recording in Jackson, Tennessee. Anybody know where Jackson, Tennessee is? Well, anyway, it's down there on the bottom of the map. So I went for a very nice ride around Jackson. Um, and then I thought, well, uh, and that was whatever it was, an hour or something, um, an hour, hour of riding. And I thought, well, um, how long would it take for me to get to, to St. Louis from there? Well, it turns out Google tells me that would take uh, four hours by car. But if I cycled it, it would actually take about 21 hours. Um, which is kind of uncomfortable. Turns out that's not too dissimilar to what I actually did in the end, but not on a bicycle. So this is just one roundabout way of saying I'm delighted to be here. And um, again, thank you to uh, everybody, but Jeff and Bronis for really making this possible. Now this story actually, um, it doesn't start in a French chateau, but it, um, a lot of it happened there, and some of the more recent happened, uh, work happened there. Uh, at some workshops that uh, Jack Dongara and Bernard Tenoshu uh, run. Um, and this was the uh, CCDSC um, workshop where um, Manish Parasha and I got together and we started talking about how can we make, how can we look at the impact of computer science research and maybe try and improve uh, that impact or pathways to impact. 
Um, so we had some discussions, and I must admit that there was a certain amount of uh, red wine, red French wine, and the like, which um, moved the conversation along. Um, and then following that, we put together a, 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 an issue of IEEE Computer, which is in the top right-hand corner there, um, and we coined this term, or coined it, but we, we uh, borrowed this term, translational computer science, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, and we wrote down what we thought were the issues in translating computer science research, and I'm going to talk about those today. Subsequent to that, we put together a, uh, a series of invited talks at SC19. Some of you may have come to those where we invited uh, colleagues to come and talk about their work, but also how they were translating it. Um, we put together a special issue of the Journal of Computational Science, um, in which we had something like about a dozen uh, people put together papers, some of them who gave talks at SC and then some additional ones. Um, and we now have a new department in IEEE, uh, computer science, Computers in Science and Engineering, which is an ongoing thing. So, so we've got a little bit of momentum behind this, and I want to talk to you about it and um, really bounce those ideas off you a little bit. So I'll talk about translational research in general, in medicine, and then in computer science. Um, I'm going to tie this back to the Ken Kennedy um, Award by talking about some of the projects I've run over the last number of years and, and why I think they, are in fact, fit the template. Uh, I'm going to go through some issues and some problems with TCS, Translational Computer Science, um, and um, give you some stuff on, on, on student role and the like. So. So I think most people have heard of translational medicine. Um, this is a, an interdisciplinary branch of biomedical uh, research in which they talk about three pillars. They talk about the bench side, the bedside, and the community. And the, work, the research work is often done at the bench. It's translated to the bedside. In other words, we apply it to real patients or uh, as real therapies. Um, and we engage with a community. And I think it's that third community aspect that really starts to put uh, an angle on this, which makes a little bit different from the normal research pipeline. Um, so these are combined together. It's not the same as applied research. Applied research is where you take a problem and say, I'm going to try and solve that. And then you go about the process of doing that, and maybe you do some evaluation. But there isn't necessarily that engagement with community and that translation into practice. So translational medicine is, is as I said, it's a, it's a very well understood um, concept now. There are journals of translational medicine. Um, and in fact, some people are now kicking back a little bit and saying, well, we've gone too much that way. Um, so that's kind of an interesting debate in its own right. The idea is that it helps with, with outcomes. It helps with impact because it engages the community in which you're applying the work during the process. OK, so what happens when we want to talk about translational computer science is we map that across um, and then hopefully pick up some of the benefits. So we take research from the laboratory bench, and that's not a bad term. We can stick with bench, um, even though it may not be a wet lab. Um, instead, of, well, instead of going to the bedside, we go from laboratory to what we're calling a locale. Um, think of the locale as something which could be physical or it could be virtual. The thing about our world is that sometimes the things we do are in fact virtual. Um, and the important issue here is that we add in community. We engage with a community uh, in, in that translation process. So it's really, it is the analog of translational medicine and we've really changed, changed the three pillar terms from uh, bench, bedside and community to laboratory, locale uh, and, and uh, community as well. So let me tell you um, this in the context of two projects that uh, are mentioned in the, in the Ken Kennedy abstract um, that I've been working on for too many years, maybe. Um, certainly a long time these projects have been coming. So I'm going to tell you about two of these. And some of you might have heard of some of the work we've done. Uh, one of them is a distributed computing toolkit called Nimrod. Uh, Nimrod has many forms. It's survived over a long period. Um, and it's a distributed computing toolkit that allows you to set up experiments that these days we call embarrassingly parallel, or some people call it pleasingly parallel. These are large what if, uh, allows you to do large what if experiments, computational experiments, on an infrastructure which could be anything from a, a network of machines right through to clouds and grids. Uh, we've produced a number of versions of this software over the years, and, and I won't drill down on any of it, but there's one called Nimrod G, which is reasonably well known, where we do um, a parameter sweep across things. You can specify parameters and say, here is my model that I wanted to run. 
go away and do that work for me. And I don't want to worry about what happens after that, just come back with a whole stack of answers. Um, there's a version called Nimrod O that does optimization, and that's where you phrase a question like, what parameter set will minimize or maximize the output of this model, rather than just saying, look at all combinations, and that's very useful for, de for, uh, for designing um, devices or, or you know, anything where you want to do an evaluation. This version called Nimrod E that uses some experiment design. I saw Box was, uh, Box was cited up on the slide the other night. Um, Box is famous for his work on experimental design. Uh, and then there's a version called Nimrod, Nimrod K that does workflows. So um, the beautiful thing about this project is that you know, we always felt we had at least 26 versions, but then we launched into two letter codes. So we had plenty of room to do many more versions. Now this has survived um, workstations, clusters, grids, clouds, probably um, you know, the fog and whatever else might come next. So we've managed to move through multiple uh, layers of, of different technology platforms. <coughs> and I like to think that along the way we've contributed to the understanding of HPC and distributed computing in general. I want to illustrate this with an example which to this community um, is not particularly surprising. Uh, when I have given versions of this talk to others, I set the scene a little bit more for them. Um, so this is an experiment where some uh, environmental scientists came to and said, what would happen if we burnt the savannah, as in fact was done by indigenous people 40,000 years ago, if we burnt the savannah, would, could that have any effect on climate and weather? Now you might imagine that that's theoretically possible, right? It's going to change a whole stack of the surface physics, it's going to change um, the nature of the planetary boundary layer. Uh, as a thought experiment, it's kind of interesting. But as a real experiment, and I, and, I, and I won't insult this audience by saying, how would you do that experiment? But I love asking that question for more naive audiences because um, you know, obviously the answer is, well, if you're doing the real experiment, you have to go and burn down the savannah and measure does something happen and then a statistician will say, well actually you need to do that probably 50 or 100 times to get some statistical significance. Um, but of course we do this computationally. And, and so um, in constructing an experiment to do that, we, uh, we did in fact configure up uh, climate models which took enough account of the underlying physics uh, and then changed those conditions and Nimrod Nimrod G was in fact the tool of choice for doing that experimentation. Now I'll put you out of your misery. If you want to know, the answer is if you burn the savannah long enough and hard enough at the right time of the year, you could actually affect the onset of the monsoon. So that's a fairly dramatic uh, potential environmental impact from doing something that doesn't seem that dramatic. Um, the graph on the bottom there is showing the, the conditions under which you actually have to burn that at the, at the time of the year. The outcome of it, and, the, and I want to talk about the science outcomes here, was ultimately a publication in a science journal about what would happen if you did this. So along the way in doing the computer science research, we've answered some questions for, all, for some people in environmental science. But, but along the way, we also learned a lot about how to build distributed computing tools. Because you know what, when you try this stuff for real, sometimes things don't work. Um, if you're trying it on a grid of computers that are in fact distributed globally, you might find that your scheduling algorithms don't work or that the mechanisms you use for moving data from one place to another don't work. Um, you know, I'm going to stand up here and tell you lots of things that we did didn't work and we didn't find out until we tried it in anger on some real experiments. The graph at the bottom shows the utilization of machines um, and if you look carefully at it, you'll see that it stops in the middle. That's a period where we stopped and we took down the middleware and we rebuilt some of those algorithms and relaunched it. The science continued from that point on, but we then had different scheduling algorithms in there to try and do a better job of it. So the outcome of that was a whole stack of publications in the computer science arena um, about how to move data over international networks, how to schedule the work, how to do fault tolerance, um, what the grid middleware needs to look like and the like. So, dual outcomes. This is another project on which I've been engaged for a number of years um, and uh, it's in debugging and, and uh, here's the one of the examples, in fact it's something we reported at supercomputing uh, many years ago um, in which um, Ian Foster and John Michalakis were looking at what happens if they took um, MM5 which was a climate model and produced a parallel version of that. 
uh, and ran it on the machines. Now, in doing so, what they discovered is that the parallel version was generating different answers. Okay, so to this community, that's something that many of you are familiar with. You run a complex numerical code, you find it's getting slightly different answers. One of the problems is that often people say they have a hypothesis that, oh, it's just things like rounding error, right? There are some minor differences and that's what you might expect to happen. Well, this was no uh, different. Um, there have been many cases where we've uh, looked at codes like this and people have said, oh, it's just some rounding error. Well, it turns out, in hindsight, there were two completely different changes, I won't call them errors, but changes in the code as it migrated from MM5 to MPMM. Um, and these are illustrated in that top um, graphic in the top there. What that's showing is the ice, an ISO surface of difference between the temperature in the 3D space between the two models. So we've calculated the differences, we've drawn an ISO surface around it, and we're showing the error between the two. Now I took that picture and I showed it to a colleague who's a climate scientist. He hadn't seen any of the code and I said, what do you think's going on? And he said, I don't think there's one uh, error in this, there are two. And the reason he said that is that you've got different physics at the top of the atmosphere and the bottom of the atmosphere. Uh, so I took this back to, uh, to John and, and they had a look at the code and it turns out that there were differences in the planetary boundary layer physics and there were differences in the solar radiation code. Now one of the hints that there were two differences there is showing up in that um, video at the bottom where you see the ISO surface growing in time. Um, and in fact, you see the, um, the sausage at the top, form, we called it the sausage at the top, forming at a different time. Um, there's no way in one time step you can get from the bottom of the atmosphere to the top. Um, these are differential equations solved over a grid. And so that was also a hint that maybe something else is happening in the physics at the top of the atmosphere in that, in that roller, solar radiation code, which is different from the planetary boundary layer. So I, you know, that for me was, was a demonstration that the debugging techniques we were building are really incredibly powerful. And what followed from that in the CS domain was years of work um, in which we've worked out how to build parallel debuggers. Now there's a lot of complexity in there. You're talking now about running on hundreds of thousands of cores with GPUs um, and, and the, just the complexity in how you build out an infrastructure is sort of characterized by that mess on the left that I won't talk about, but we have talked about many times about, you know, there's a lot of computer science that's been learnt on how to do that. Um, this is actually now, uh, if you buy a Cray, and this is not an advertisement, but if you buy a Cray, you get a copy of our debugger because that's been commercialised there. Now, the CS outcomes have been reported again in CS journals and the like. I just want to very quickly say that we're not the only group, I'm not the only person who's been doing this, and as I said, we put together some case studies um, before we ran supercomputing invited talks, but let me just go through three projects extremely quickly. Um, here's some work of Ava Dillman's group um, at ISI uh, on Pegasus, and um, Ava can tell you more about Pegasus than I can, but again, it's a workflow system that they've been working on for a number of years, looking at uh, how you build these systems. But like with the work we've done on Nimrod, um, this has been done in context of experiments. And I think all of us were extremely proud as computer scientists to see this stuff underpin things like the LIGO work. So it wasn't just that they did some experiments and worked out how to build a better workflow engine, it actually underpins the science on a daily basis. Um, here's some work of um, Ilkay Altentas from SDSC, another colleague, a uh, project called Wi-Fire in which um, they're doing, uh, again, workflow work, but also machine learning, taking data from the wildfires, California wildfires, building better workflow systems, building better machine learning algorithms, but at the same time, deployed in practice and being used to help fi fight those wildfires. And then a third example comes from um, the Globus group from Ian Foster and Carl Kesselman's work uh, in Globus that, again, They've been building out for a number of years better ways of doing distributed computing. The Nimrod work all sat on top of Globus for many years as the middleware layer. Um, and so the work that they were doing on how to build better middleware and how to distribute computations, how to do file transport and how to schedule it and all of that stuff underpinned our work, but also has been used by tens of thousands of scientists on a daily basis. So this is not, um, the, it's not that no one's doing this, it's just that, as I'll show you in a moment, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit harder to do than you might think. 
I do want to spend a minute or two just looking at the research pipeline and, and um, why this, in fact, is a little bit different. So this is a more traditional CS workflow, uh, research workflow, where we might start with a problem. Let's assume that it's a, a, an applied problem, but it doesn't have to be. It could be an artificial one. We start with a problem. We'll define it. We'll propose some solutions, maybe more than one solution. We prototype them. We build things up. We try them. And we do evaluate. It's not that we don't evaluate our work. We certainly take data sets and try it and see if it works. But at some point, we declare victory. We say, well, that's it. It worked. Great. Um, sometimes, you know, we didn't use all of the data sets we should have used. And sometimes we haven't explored all of the space. But we declare victory. Um, we publish those results. They're published in some computer science journals. We might uh, also release some code. Uh, and we might even commercialize it. That's a more traditional CS workflow. So what does translational research add to it? It adds an additional loop back and another part of the whole um, infrastructure. So that in the prototyping and evaluation, we're engaging a community. Um, I was talking last night with Charlie Catlett and the work that they're doing um, with their sensor networks, um, array of things. And you know, the, the big part of that is engaging community. In fact, a lot of the project is about getting the community on board. Because if they're not on board, you can't do the computer science research. So you engage the community, you evaluate in situ, and then you feed it back. And it's part of the project plan. I don't declare victory and then try and apply it. I apply it on the fly. I feed it back when I find it doesn't work. And lots and lots of times what we do, I have to say, just doesn't work in anger. So why isn't everybody doing it, or why isn't everybody trying to do it? So Manish and I spent um, quite a lot of uh, glasses of red wine trying to work this out. Um, and um, here are what we think are the issues. There are, there are something like about half a dozen roadblocks that maybe hold us back. Uh, one of them is computer science translation is not commercialization. I'll dig down to these in a moment. Um, people sometimes say open source is about translation. Um, there's a whole stack of issues around the funding agencies. PhD programs are fairly rigid and don't necessarily support it. Traditional publication venues don't necessarily support it. And there aren't that many exemplars. So let me just dig down on each one of those. Translation is not commercialization. Sometimes translation may happen as part of commercialization, but it's not, it's not intrinsically bound up to it, with it. So if you take some research, I showed you on that earlier workflow, you may take some research and spin it out and say, here, company, or my company, go and commercialize this. Now, you may find out at that point that some things don't work. But it's kind of too late. The research project is finished. So it's a separate phase. The other thing about commercialization is it often involves money, hopefully involves money. Um, and that's necessarily not an artifact of translation in its own right. So they're really two separate things. Um, well, I'm putting my source code out there in GitHub. Isn't that translation? Other people can access my source code. And again, it's not exactly the same. Yes, open source repositories and multiple communities working on the source are a good thing to do um, and, and can aid translation, but they're not necessarily translation in their own right. So there isn't a direct link between those two things. Um, you'll find that we do often use open source techniques in a, in a translational project, but not necessarily. You don't have to do that. Um, what open source is about is producing software that's scalable and, and maybe has a distributed workforce. This is a big one, right? Um, funding bodies typically don't support translation. If I write a research project application and I say, here's the work I want to do. It's an important problem. I'm going to solve it using these techniques. Um, and then I'm going to evaluate it. And what you'll get out of it, research funding agency, is um, a bunch of papers that makes my H index look better, and you'll be happy. Um, or maybe uh, I will commercialize it, but that's not necessarily tied to that. Um, if I try and do a translational research project where I say, well, I also need a couple of EFTs in the translation process. I need someone to work the community to help me evaluate it. Um, a few things could happen. Either the, tr the funding agency will say, well, that doesn't match our template. You're not going to do that. Um, or they may say, it may get all the way through, yeah, this is a good idea. And they'll say, well, you want another couple of EFTs? We're going to have to squeeze somewhere. We'll throw out the translation bit. So um, 
Now, there's nothing intrinsically wrong. In fact, what we're arguing is that funding agencies should embrace this, and they have in medicine. Um, but in traditional CS and engineering, um, that's not necessarily recognised, and the people who are on the grant evaluation committees don't necessarily recognise it. So a budget that allocates resources in some of these community translational feedback aspects may or may not um, get up. Also, the duration of the project may need to be longer than what you might have previously asked for. In Australia, a, a well-funded project lasts for three years, but sometimes translation takes longer than that, and I need, to, I need a mechanism for stretching things out. PhD pipelines. So PhD students are, of course, our workforce in a lot of this. Um, you know, hard problem, we don't know how to solve it. Let's give it to a PhD student, they'll work out how to do it. Uh, and, but the problem is our PhD programs are, are fairly regimented. Um, they're different in Australia and in the US. Uh, in Australia, it's like pretty typically three, three years, you're in and you're out. Three and a half years, right? No mucking around, no coursework per se. Um, uh, and to build a translational part into a project like that is really quite hard. Uh, in the US, even though you've got longer, it's harder because you've got a lot of coursework built into that. So the PhD programs haven't really adapted themselves to this mode of interaction. Um, and you can be creative about this. So it may not be that any individual student does the whole thing. Uh, it may be that they're working on part of a larger bit, and it could be, in theory, a PhD student could only do the translational bit, the evaluation bit. And if you go back to your PhD guidelines, it says, well, clearly it has to be original work, um, then, then you, know, you can, may trip up over those. So we think that we need to rethink PhDs, as the UK did when it brought in the doctoral training centres, not for translational purposes, but they did change the way you do a PhD in order to, to get more engagement with, um, with the third disciplines. Traditional publications don't value translation um, for, for quite a lot of reasons. There are now journals of translational medicine. There are no journals of translational computer science, and they look a little bit different. They're not your normal, well, you know, I built the thing, I tried it, here's the results, bang, you know, cite me, please. Um, in fact, sometimes what you're writing up is a project that didn't work. How many times do we publish our failures? I know this topic comes up um, over the years, right? Sometimes we need to say, this didn't work. It looked great until I translated it. And it's quite possible someone else will come along and say, yeah, but if I just tweak this um, and, and build on what you've done, I think I could make it work. So we need to rethink what it is we're publishing. Um, sometimes translation is just not well aligned enough with the primary goal of the journal. And then finally, this lack of exemplars. Well, I've shown you some exemplars. So it's not that there are none, but, but um, you know, if you're trying to build a community and get people on board, the best thing you can do is show them how to do it. You know, I can't be what I can't see. We need more of that, more people doing it so that other people can stand back and say, well, not just that was a good project, um, but that was a good project because it used this research template. So we think that that's worth doing. Okay, so funding. What's the problem with funding? Well, it's not just a question of more funding. Never let it be said that I got up here and said, well, you know, the NSF and the Australian Research Council and the UK EPSERC and whatever, they should just put more money into it because if they just put more money into it and don't change the guidelines, we haven't actually achieved what we need to do. Um, we need to build translation into the research plan. I need to be able to write a research plan that says, I do need a couple of EFTs to evaluate this, to work alongside my scientists and computer scientists and integrate it, and I might need longer to do it, and here's all the things I need to do. So I think um, a rethink of the way we do our research projects and apply for funding around them is an important thing to do. And as I said before, we should be free to report on both successes and failures. We don't all want failures all the time, but you know, if, if it's a good failure, I want to hear about it. <laughs> Because someone else maybe work out a way around it. Um, our promotion structures, our venues and our reward structure don't value this at all. Right? If you're up for tenure, um, you know, let's face it, it's going to be largely based on what your publications look like, you know, how many grants you've got, how much money you've got coming in, um, and, and um, uh, you know, what's your H index. Um, if you say, well, I took an extra year on this project to try and translate it, 
you know, it's probably not going to get the attention of the, the, the discipline panel doing your evaluation. And that's us. So this is a case of where, well, you know, we, if we want to do this, we've actually got to change how we reward people. Um, the places in which you might want to publish it, again, need to change. Um, these metrics need to get integrated into promotion processes. And so that ties into the whole education and training thing, is that really we also need to be building this into our curricula, probably into our PhD programs, which we've now modified to do translation. Maybe we need some additional materials in there to help people do it. Um, it's a question of showing people what to do and how to do it. Okay, so that's the things we think that hold it back and they're not insurmountable, they're completely solvable. Um, now one of the things Manish and I discovered along the way is that for the people who are doing it, it seems that lab scale matters. If you're one person working on your own, it's very hard to do full-blown translational research. If you're part of a much larger lab, then this becomes possible. So drawing on some personal experience I've had, um, this is a lab, the one in the middle there, message lab, is something I built at Monash when I was there. And you can see a bunch of people working on stuff. Um, and the tools are all in there. You can see the different versions of Nimrod and the different versions of Guard. And so the artifacts that we're building are all part of that lab. But because the scale is large enough, I can bleed around the edges where maybe I didn't get funding for doing translation, but I can get a little bit creative about what people are actually doing and how they're helping each other. Uh, and this holds out when we've looked at all of the other exemplars that, that were published in the journal, we found that lab scale actually makes a difference because if you've got enough people, someone can say, well, okay, I'll help you with this. If you help me with that bit, we get some economy of scale. And so on the left-hand side here, you can see that this was at, at Monash, my previous employer. We engaged with almost every faculty faculty in the Australian sense, not faculty in the US sense, uh, in the university. Um, we had examples of Nimrod being used in every possible place. We also engaged externally uh, with a whole bunch of external universities. Um, now that's really hard to do if it's just one of you, but if there's lots of you, and I'll show you in a moment how we engage students in this, because they're great labour for in fact spreading stuff out um, cheaply. Um, and um, so we can engage with many more people globally. And on the right hand side you can see we also started talking, we talked to industry along the way, we got various industry grants, sometimes we spun things out and commercialised them, and sometimes we just worked with industry partners who are interested. So the scale of that whole thing makes a, makes a difference. One of the um, scale out things we did use in, in our own work was um, this Pragma initiative that um, Peter Artsberger and Phil Papadopoulos and a whole bunch of other people uh, had running uh, for many years where we built a collaborative network across the uh, Pacific Rim. Pacific Rim was often interpreted fairly uh, liberally because I know it got as far as Illinois and as far as India. Um, but the idea was we built a distributed network of people who wanted to work together. Um, and this had two aspects to it. There was the technology sense. We put technology in places and tried things. Uh, and then there was the person, the people aspect of it as well. So this, this was very successful. And I used this work in the Savannah burn experiment that I showed you earlier because we distributed the computations across the Pacific Rim, across machines in many places. So the, the graph at the bottom is showing data moving internationally. Uh, we discovered things about our international networks and our, uh, our network providers that we didn't know when we started. Uh, and so the translation there actually became important, but it was leveraging this network of, of uh, machines across the grid. Now one of the things Peter and I did, uh, and, and others did, but one of the things Peter and I did was formalise then a student exchange program on top of it. And, and I don't have time to really drill into it, but this was one of the most exciting aspects of what we did, is there were multiple programs, um, one out of UCSD called Prime, a couple of out of Australia uh, called Merper and Quirper, and one out of Japan called Prius, in which we sent, uh, we sent undergraduate students abroad so they now become part of this larger workforce. And what we did is said, over your summer vacation, which unfortunately was winter in many other places in the world, we say, go away and work with this group and, and do this multidisciplinary thing. I'll show you an example of this in a moment, but you can see in the photos there, some of the bright young faces um, that we sent abroad. Pretty brave thing to do. The last student we sent abroad, um, it, it seems with hindsight now, he actually caught COVID uh, on his weekend off in New York, but uh, nonetheless, and we haven't managed to do it since. 
And you can see Larry Sma down the bottom there has been very supportive of this work at, at Cal IT too. So dropping students into an internship abroad over their summer and then they come back and then they do their final year project with us turns out to be a very powerful thing to do. Now, here's an example of, um, uh, of just one project uh, that I, I won't dwell on, but this is one undergraduate UCSD student who came to Monash. He was working on cardiac um, modeling from Andrew McCulloch's group at UCSD, studying a thing called left bundle branch block, which is a, a failure, a heart failure. Uh, simulating it and then combining that with Nimrod coming into my lab and saying right we'll put the cardiac model inside Nimrod and we'll do the experiments there um, he started to play around with techniques for doing pacemaker management this is an undergraduate student it just blew me away he's now gone on to be uh, a doctor I think I mean MD so incredibly powerful but layered on top of that pragma network layered on top of this translational process it all starts to come together now you'll laugh when I tell you this, but you know, um, one of the challenges we had was introducing the students to what was happening at the other campuses. So we came up with this brilliant idea that why don't we run some international seminars by video conference. Um, wow, are we all sick of video conference uh, seminars at the moment. But um, so Larry Sma, who was pushing the whole MPEG-2 over the international networks at the time, uh, worked with us on this and we were streaming seminars backwards and forwards and there you can see a list of people down the left that you probably can't read it but um, we managed to get most people to give a seminar on what was happening and then the student could say oh that's the lab I want to go to and so that was another component to this whole thing. Uh, on top of that I got this um, crazy idea that I'd start to bring high school students to supercomputing so we've been doing that uh, modulo COVID for about 10 years um, and, and bringing groups to, to SC and just dropping them in the deep end, right? They just, they just go wild out there when they see what's going on. Um, a, a metric of whether that worked is when we came back. So on the bottom left here is a picture of a high school group getting a class by Bob Simkovitz from SDSC on uh, Python notebooks. Um, so he's teaching them remotely. Um, and on the right hand side is a picture of what I found out when I went out to their school, they came back from SC, I went out to their school and said, so what did you do? I said, oh, well, we wired up the school, right? We built this weather station networky thing with Arduinos or raspberries or something like that. And they just did this because of what they saw. So this was really, really very exciting to see what happens when you just drop smart people in the deep end and then see, see what, and some of those kids, call them kids because I'm getting older, but some of those kids have now gone on and done PhDs in astrophysics and the like. So um, I think watching that pipeline is, is pretty exciting. So I want to tie all of this back then to, you know, so what has this got to do with Ken and Ken's name? Um, and so I dug out the, the citation from the actual, the award itself. Um, that Ken made theoretical impact um, you know, in, in, in compilers, which of course we all know, and fundamental theoretical impact. And by the way, some of the things that he did, we've used along the way in our own work, the debugger work, used some of the data decomposition stuff that Ken's group did in, in HPF. So um, there's, a, there's a loose link there. Um, but compiler work is really not done in isolation, right? It's, it's hard to imagine doing compiler development and never trying it. Um, there's a bit of a play on words, I guess, around translation, but, um, but uh, it's clearly you have to evaluate compilers along the way. So, so it's really very appropriate that I give you this talk and give you a formal structure around it uh, in the context of Ken's own work, because um, I think he was doing translational computer science long before we talked about it. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's really delightful to be able to do that. Uh, here's a little bit of fun just as I'm getting towards the end here. Um, uh, so, for something completely different, uh, a few years back I decided to write a play, uh, some of you have actually seen it uh, staged, uh, about academia and um, this, is, this is an unapologetic advertisement. If you go to purely-academic.com, you can now buy the novella version, it's on Amazon, it's on Barnes and Noble, so uh, that's a bit of fun um, and some of the stories in there you might link back to, uh, link back to the, uh, the projects I talked about. And I'm going to finish up there and leave you with some pictures of my stained glass windows, which also have nothing to do with research translation, but they're a bit prettier. I might be better known for my windows than, than uh, my computer science research. <laughs>
Um, and I've got a few minutes left for questions, I think, Bill. Thank you.